I, uh, I've got some things that I want to share with you that have to do with the topic of intercessory prayer. I'm not going to believe that everybody in here even knows what that means. Um, this church is very unique in the fact that it has people that have walked with God a very long time. <clears throat> and it's unique in the fact that we got people in here this first time they've ever been to church in their life. Had a lady come in last week. My wife met her. She came in and she was kind of standoffish. And my wife saw her in the hallway. She said, you know, I, I've never been to church. And uh, this is my first time ever being in a church. And then she stopped and said, and I like it. If you're here today and you're in church for the first time, we hope you like it today. <clears throat> and you are certainly welcome uh, into this fellowship. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, and then John chapter 20. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. This is not intercessory prayer. I want to build up to it. I didn't get finished in the last service. I don't see myself getting finished with it. When I study it, y'all, I don't know how long it's going to take to say it. Okay. So I study it and I say, okay, that's about a good 40 minutes worth and then find out that it's an hour and a half's worth. <clears throat> so I'm not trying to rush through this series. I hope you don't get bored this year because we've been in it a long time, but I am intent on this being a praying church when I get through with this series, amen? Where when you need to pray, you know how to pray and you know what to do and you don't need a church service and you don't need to call anybody for help. You got it on your own. That's my goal. Let me show you something here. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. That's a paradox. How do you even do that? I don't see what I can see, but I can see what I can't see. That's what that's saying. If that were not in the Bible, it would not even make sense. But because we are people of God, we know that there is a world we can't see. God made the heavens and God made the earth. The heavens is an invisible world but it's the parent world to the physical. And everything that happens in the physical is a result of things that are happening in the spirit realm. You know what I believe is happening in the spirit realm right now? I believe there's a lot of conflict and a lot of chaos. I believe governments in the spirit realm are switching and changing and shifting because look at all that is happening in our world and all the confusion. What that tells me is there is a conflict going on in the world we cannot see. The Bible says everything's seen was made from things we can't see. So everything that we see, the Bible says, look, they're temporary. Things which are not seen are eternal. The things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. So in other words, other word, if I can't see it, then I've got to have faith that God said it. And while I cannot see what God said with my eyes, his promises paint a picture on the canvas of my heart. <laughs> and what I have to do is not look at what my eyes can see when it contradicts the picture that God put inside of me. <laughs> okay? You have to hold on to what's inside of you because what is inside of you is not lying. What you see is lying. So people, one time I said, I said, well, you know, why don't you do such and such? They said, because our credit's bad. I said, well, how bad? They're like, it's bad. I'm like, well, it's not a terminal disease. It's subject to change. Our financial situation, pastor, it's bad. Well, how bad? It's not terminal. It is subject, I'm trying to encourage somebody. It's subject to change. Well, our marriage, we hadn't been getting along. It's been bad. Well, how bad is it? Why? It's not a terminal disease. God can turn that thing around. There are things going on in the spirit realm that you can't see, but if you can tap into it, I'm amazed at how Hollywood and everybody else is in an all-out search for another world they can't see. But the church never talks about it. And we're the only ones that have access to it. So God has blessed me with everything, all every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 4. So in other words, it's all there, but my eyes can't perceive it. So I gotta believe God that when he promised it, even though my eyes can't see it, it exists. And you've gotta know that it is your enemy's job, the devil, to create something around you that contradicts what God said in you. Peter walked on the water because he heard Jesus say, come to me. And the Bible says, and then he saw 
the wind and the waves and he began to sink. Whenever God gives you a promise, I know you get excited, but you better get ready for the assault on your soul. Because the enemy wants you to see something that talks you out of what God said. But look at your neighbor and say, the thing in you ain't lying. Come on, tell them it ain't lying. Don't use correct English and say it is not. Say it ain't lying. Okay. <clears throat> I know I'm in a very educated area, but I didn't have that much education. So it's ain't. A-I-N apostrophe T. Okay. Next verse. Keep playing just a moment. Here. John 20. I'm just trying to set, set this teaching up. Jesus has died, been buried, put in the tomb, and he's been raised again, and Mary is now visiting the tomb. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. She's crying. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, verse 12. And she saw two angels sitting, one at the head and one at the feet of where the body of Jesus had lain. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because you've taken away my Lord and I don't know where you've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She supposing him to be the gardener said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabbani, which is teacher. She recognized him. I won't go to the next verse. That's a different message. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Loosen up, everybody. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go. Come on, tell them, here we go. Do you have any idea how hot this coat is? I'm going to plow through it. I'm going to plow through it and make it happen. I am burning up, though. <clears throat> I took it off in the first service. But this is the second service, and this is the one we use to broadcast to 1.6 million people. So I figure I need to be up here in a Hanes t-shirt preaching, so I'm gonna keep it on and I'm gonna lose 10 pounds while I'm doing it today. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. What was I preaching about? I forgot what I was doing. Okay, yeah, John 20. For we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen is eternal. Let me go ahead and further illustrate this with this message right here we just read in John 20. Mary is looking at the tomb profusely crying. The angels aren't crying. The angels are in the unseen realm. They're spirits. The Bible said they're ministering spirits. They see the unseen realm. All Mary knows is loss. I've lost somebody. She's looking at what she can see and she's letting it determine and drive her emotion. The angels are sitting there at the foot and at the head, they fine. I mean, they drinking a Coke and eating a pack of crackers, they fine. She's crying, the angels are not crying, why? Because they know something she doesn't know. The Bible says when Jesus was dead, he descended into the belly of the earth. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. Let me tell you something. All she knows is he's gone, but there is a spiritual work that is taking place where Jesus is bringing you victory and bringing you triumph, and even death will lose its sting and can't hold you down. It will have to release you into an eternity with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when he was dead, he led captivity captive. Everything that is trying to hold you captive, Jesus took it and made it a captive. Come on, somebody. So there was a lot going Going on, Mary could not see it. She was fixed on what she could see, but the angels tapped into another realm and they knew what was really happening. Let me tell you something. What is going on is never what's going on. Some of you right now, you're experiencing lack, you're experiencing difficulty, you're experiencing restraint, you're experiencing obstacles, and you think that is the reality of your situation. Let me tell you something. You might be disappointed, but your angels are not disappointed. Come on. You might be in a tough place, but your angels are not in a plus tough place. Looking not at the things which are seen. I'm preaching to somebody. But the things which are unseen, for the things which I can see are subject to turn around and change. But God knows something eternal in my life. Life, and God, if I can stay focused on it, 
it won't be long before it'll be birthed in this earth realm. I'm talking to somebody who needs to hear this today. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> I've got to understand this is the key to intercessory prayer. What does that have to do with prayer? What's going on here does not always reflect what's going on there. She's crying. The angels aren't crying. We know what we see. Heaven has a plan that we can't see. <laughs> okay? Heaven is not nervous about your life today. Heaven is not losing sleep and heaven is not having anxiety because the plan is mapped out and it's there. There are angels warring on your behalf right now that you, whoo, shade, hallelujah. I felt that one. I felt that. There are angels being dispatched from the throne room of God right now that are fighting over your household, fighting over your life, fighting over your businesses that you know nothing about. And just because, what is, I just hear this in my spirit, what is going on is not what's going on. You need to even look at maybe your wife or your neighbor beside you or your husband and say what's happening is not what's happening. There is something stirring in the spirit realm that I cannot see, but I know God is working on my behalf. Yeah. <laughs> Can I go further? <clears throat> now, when it comes to the Christian, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Let's throw that up there. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. There we go. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You're a chosen generation, royal priesthood. You are a whole new nation. I wish racist people could get that. Some of you that are racist, you're going to need itch cream when you get to heaven. <laughs> I believe the church is supposed to be a picture of heaven, a snapshot of heaven. Look around this room right here and look what heaven's going to look like. Amen. <laughs> Redemption, I love you because you're doing something not many churches in America are demonstrating. <laughs> that nation supersedes every other thing I'm connected to. Everything. And we are a whole new nation of people. How do you become a person in a nation? You have to be born into it. That's why you had to be born again. When do you become a citizen? When you're born inside that country. The Bible said our citizenship is in heaven. You're not even here. You're visiting here. <laughs> you're just visiting. You're representing your country while you're here. What's your country? Heaven. So I'm here representing. Um, oh, this is good kingdom teaching right here. This ain't church. This is kingdom. <laughs> okay. This is kingdom. Now, we're a royal priesthood. Priesthood. Let me zero in on that. Priesthood, a priest and its relation to God is a worshiper. So I am now a royal <clears throat> worshiper. Royalty means I have to be king. Revelation calls you kings and priests unto your God. Did you know you're a king? Male, female, they might, you are a king. That's why the Bible says he's the king of kings, not the king of servants. That was good. I've never said that before. I need to write that down. <laughs> I mean, I'll preach a message off that. King of kings, not king of servants. <laughs> but as priests, we are worshipers. I'm a royal worshiper. As it pertains to earth and to people and to man, I'm an intercessor. A priest is a go-between. That's why the Bible calls Jesus our high priest, forever. And the Bible says right now he sits at the right hand of the father making intercession for you and me. So when I pray, I pray to Jesus. You know what he does? He being the priest turns around and takes it on in. He takes your prayers and your petitions and he makes them known to the father. Go read the old Testament. The priest would take the prayers of the saints 
in before the presence of God because they represented the people to God. We have an intercessory prayer life. Now, let me tell you what this means. Ah, I got so much, y'all. I got so much. I got, just, I got like eight different directions I can go in my head right now. <clears throat> Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Now, to be an intercessor, leave that up there if you would. This is a lot of teaching. I'll preach again in a minute. I know y'all like to see me sweat, but sometimes when you are a coach, you don't want to get hot. <laughs> Stay with me now. Intercession. I come before God and I'm a royal worshiper. When it comes before people, I'm a go-between. What did Jesus do? Lord, you can't smite them because I'm standing in between you and them. I'm interceding. Enter and seed. I am turning around and impregnating earth with what you want. I am seeding it. So my oldest son here, who had his struggles and a great testimony, turned me and his mama quickly into an interceder. <laughs> what is an interceder? When we stand between what is versus what God wants. And we find out what God wants and we turn around and seed it. Seed it and impregnate it with our prayers. Amen. Let me show you why this is so important. Verse, I think it was, was it Luke 20? No, excuse me, was it, yeah, Luke 21, somewhere in there, yeah. This is Jesus talking about the end of times. Nobody likes to talk about that because it scares them, but you ain't got nothing to worry about. There'll be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on earth, distress of nations. Do we have that right now? Look at the Middle East, look at Ukraine, look at Russia. I mean, all the time, it's always been going on. With perplexity. With perplexity. Don't hear many people preaching on YouTube about perplexity. Jesus said in the end times, now some of you say, what is the end times? The Bible's been calling the end times, the end times ever since Jesus left. They, in the first century when the book was, when the Bible was basically recorded and written, they were talking about the end times as though they were living in it. So we've been in the end times for 2,000 years, but for God it's been two days. Because with the Lord, the Bible says a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So that's why we don't know when he created the heavens and the earth in six days did he create it in six 24-hour days or did it take him 6,000 years? Yeah. So really, Jesus has only been gone two days. And they've talked about, that's good, y'all, that's good. And they've talked about it as being the end times. So don't act like, you know, 20, 2022 is this terrible thing. It's been end times ever since. He said, and there will be a rise of something called perplexities. The word perplexity in the Greek is defined this way. Problems with which there seems to be no solution. Famine. Okay, racism. I'm preaching. Homelessness. Just go down the line. Perplexities. And it don't matter who you vote for. These problems continue to exist because they're on a God level. They're not on a man level. You can't put together an agenda to fix spiritual perplexities. There is confusion in our world and our brightest minds do not have solutions. And though we try to progress and move forward, there are things that only God can take care of. So what does that mean? God has a life planned in heaven, but there are perplexities in the earth. Are you ready for this next one? All right, guys, go to Jeremiah, 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 Jeremiah. Oh, no, excuse me. Ezekiel 22, 29, and 30. <clears throat> Ezekiel 29, 20, 22, 29, and 30. 
The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated poor, needy, wrongfully oppressed the stranger. Verse 30. So I sought for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap. Oh. You man can't fix the perplexities. So I sought for somebody who would stand between heaven and earth. On behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't find anybody that would stand in between what heaven desired versus what was going on in the earth. Let me tell you something. What man can't handle, God can handle. And the Bible says amongst all things, his house, we're his house, will be a house of prayer. And if we can begin to go before the throne of God and begin to represent our land and stand in the gap between the two, God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will hear their land. Everybody don't have to pray for the land to be healed, just God's people. So the fact that the perplexities continue tells me God's people are not a people of prayer. Because God said, oh, I'm, oh, I'm looking for somebody to stand in the middle. He said, I can fix this stuff. I can fix it if somebody will be an intercessor, an interceder, somebody will stand in the gap, the gap between the chasm that separates the will of God and what's going on in the earth. Y'all seem tight in here. Are y'all all right today? <laughs> Is it just deep and so good? Is that what it is? Okay, that's the way I choose to perceive it. <clears throat> Romans chapter one. Look at, look at this house I'm building now. There's things in the spirit that the natural does not reflect. The illustration of Mary to prove my point. Now, there are perplexities in the earth that are not the will of heaven. And God said, I need somebody to get in between the two. Amen. Okay? So how did we get this way in the earth? I always try to preach with, with some symmetry so you can tell where I'm going. This is a rough scripture to read. These are scriptures nobody reads in church no more because they don't make people feel good. Okay? I'm not worried about making these things popular. I'm worried about making them powerful. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, wait a minute now. The wrath of God is being revealed by men who suppress the truth. Where did you get your core value system? If you didn't get it from truth, it's wrong. I know your grandpa was a good man. But everything my grandpa taught me wasn't right. I did not get my value system from my family, my color, my ancestors, or my educational institutions. I got my value system by the word of God. Because the Bible says that wrath only goes out to those who suppress truth. Because what may be known by God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Next verse. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and even his external power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. People say, well, what about all the people that don't get to hear the message of Jesus? What's going to happen to them? Are they going to go to heaven or not? The Bible says, even if you've never heard the gospel of Jesus, he said, there is revelation just by looking around you. When they see the birds and the bees together, when they see the foliage on the trees, when they see the crops begin to yield their fruit, he said, when you see the lion and the lamb laying down, he said, they should be able to look around them and know there is is a God in heaven and he said they have enough revelation based on my creation so they are without excuse y'all looking at me like nobody has ever told you this <laughs> amen there's a lot of other stuff in the Bible besides blessing we like blessing scriptures there's a lot of other stuff <laughs> next verse I'm gonna read through it Although they knew God, they would not glorify him. They were not thankful, futile in their thoughts. Foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. He said, 
they really increased in knowledge and thought they were something. Have you noticed we have smarter people in the world than we've ever supposedly had? But have you noticed while we got smartest people ever that common sense is almost like a superpower? If you got common sense nowadays, you could be a Marvel character. <laughs> I am amazed at how great minds can't. We are in a world where people do not want two plus two to equal four. They want it to equal anything you want it to equal. And Jesus said, man, they're smart, but they're dumb. He said, they change an incorruptible God. They work other things. I got to go quickly here. Next verse. He said, therefore, God gave them over to uncleanness, to the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their body. Yeah. Who exchanged the truth for a lie. Worship, uh, serve the creature instead of the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Go down to the last verse right there. I got I to gotta save my time. Go down. And, they, and even as they did not uh, like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. God gave them over three times. Stay with me. This is very important. I know I'm not preaching as animated as normal. This is really heavy stuff. I want you to get it. We're talking about why do I need to stand in the gap and intercede? We got in this predicament of perplexities, problems with which there seemed to be no solution. Watching a movie the other day, and the person asked the other one, said, why don't you have faith in God? He said, because there's too much bad, and he said, expletive in the world. And I'm like, why does God always get hung with the bad when the people did the bad? God did not create this chaos we're living in. God created heaven. People full of sin created this mess we're living in. But I don't know why we won't hang it on people. We keep hanging it on God. Okay? Listen to the wrath. The wrath of God is being poured out. They take the truth and they suppress it. They won't acknowledge it. They choose to have their own belief system instead of my belief system. They exchange the truth for a lie, thinking they're becoming wise. They've just become more foolish. He says, so God gave them over to their own lust. He said their lust became vile. Their lust became unnatural. He said, and God gave them over. Then it goes two verses down, and God gave them over to their own desires. And it goes down two more verses, verse 28, and God gave them over to a debased mind or their own thought life. God said, I gave them over, I gave them over, I gave them over. The wrath of God is not what you see in a movie. Fire and brimstone from him. God's mad at everybody and playing like a video game with earth. That's not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is God turning you over to yourself. The wrath of God has visited your house when he has toiled with you, toiled with you, toiled with you, and toiled with you, and finally he just says, okay. I'm going to turn you over to your desires. I'm going to turn you over to your passions, and I'm going to turn you over to your mindset. Come back and tell me when you hit bottom. <laughs> I'm amazed how our generation, well, you do what feels good. You do what feels... <laughs> to a kid, 27 candy bars a day feels good. <laughs> do you tell them to do it? No. Okay? I'd love to have a rack of baby, board, baby back pork ribs every day. That's what my passions are. <laughs> but take you a whole bottle of, uh, you know, blood pressure pills and set them on the table while you eat it. And I just do what feels good. There's nothing that will destroy you like you. I have to be, deli God deliver Ron for Ron. The devil ain't the problem, Ron's the problem. I need you to keep Ron from Ron. Ron screws up, Ron don't think right. Ron don't always have the right desires. I need you to guard me from me. Don't turn me loose, don't quit dealing with me, God. That's the worst thing that can happen because wrath comes when you leave me to myself. I feel the weight of this. I can feel it. 
When I preach these heavy messages, I can feel the weight of it up here while I'm saying it. Perplexities. How? Because God got tired of wrestling with people and said, you fix it. And it keeps... Now, let me go, what time is it? Ooh, ooh, I'm sorry, y'all. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> Isaiah 53, three for five. Give me five minutes on this one and I'll hold on to next week. I love you. Do you love me? Yes or no? How many of you ever sent that love note when you was in school? No, oh, y'all, y'all too big for that, right? I sent them to a lot of girls. I sent one to Hope when I met her in college. I love you. Do you love me? Yes or no? And didn't you hate it when they would put back maybe? I didn't create a box for maybe. It was yes or it was no. This is very clear. And they put one in the middle, maybe, and check it. <laughs> Isaiah 53 This is the prophet Isaiah, 800 years before Jesus was born, prophesying about him. I read a statistic where getting this prophecy 100% accurate, 800 years before somebody was born, the chances of that were like one in six or 700 billion. For people who don't think the Bible is true, the symmetry of the Bible is unbelievable. So this is what the prophet saw. He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. Somebody say hallelujah for that right there. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. Do you see that verse right there? He took your sin away. He took your iniquity away. He bought your peace back for you and by his stripes he can heal any disease you have ever been diagnosed with. That one verse right there. What a wonderful Jesus I worship. That's why we clap our hands. That's why we shout. Those of you that say, why did they amen? Why did they get out of their seats? Because I got some Somebody that's willing to do that for me, I can't come in here and act like Jesus hasn't done anything for me. Somebody take five seconds and thank God that he was willing to be wounded for you. Hey! I'm sorry. I need three more minutes. I'm sorry. Oh, this coat is hot. Put it back up there if you would, please. Let me finish it on out. I got to hurry. Chastising my peace and by stripes were healed. Next verse. I had another one in it. Yeah. Skip on down to verse 12. He said, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to, unto death. Man, poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is really going to challenge you. To become an intercessor, you can't distance yourself from the problem. You have to identify with it. Revelation on being numbered with the transgressor. Jesus didn't look at the Father and say, I didn't do all that craziness. They the ones down there acting crazy. I ain't got nothing to do. I ain't like that. Uh-uh. He said, I'm one of them. And you can't smite them because I am one of them. And if you smite them, you smite me. This is going to challenge you. Let me keep going. Whenever there have been problems in my home, I look at it, say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm not distancing myself from it. I am it. 
I'm numbered with them. Jesus without spot, nor wrinkle, radiant, beautiful light, the expressed image of God, image of God, and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says he became sin. Became the thing he hated and identified with every one of us who had the disease. And he said, God, don't smite them. I'm one of them. I'm numbered with them. And he became sin for us. When a preacher acts up and does something stupid and they done embezzled money or they done run off with a piano player or something. <laughs> I remember I used to, they would bring that up and I'm like, no, man, I'm, don't, don't, don't number me with them. Don't get, you know what I've learned since then? God forgive us. When some church does something that doesn't represent Jesus in a community, you know what this church needs to say? God forgive us. God forgive us. <laughs> some of my best, greatest friends in the world are African-American pastors and preachers. And I remember when all these racial tensions broke out, whether, I don't care where you fall politically, I called them. And I said, forgive us. I would love to distance myself from, oh, don't group me with them. Them's crazy people. They're not represent. Mm. Man, I'm sorry. And I need you to forgive us. Forgive. Numbered. Well, I told you it's going to challenge you. Numbered with the transgressors. That is intercession. You can't smite them because I am one of them. And if you smite them, you smite me with them. So God, I stand in the gap between the perplexities that exist versus heaven's desire. And let me be the conduit by which heaven can flow into the earth. That is intercessory prayer. Next week, I will give you four biblical examples. Can you stand up and put your hands together all over this building? Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. If I've gone too long and inconvenienced you for that, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry for preaching too long. I love you guys. And I commit to you to tell you the truth as the word of God, not as I was raised, not as my Southern culture, not to go to the word of God and tell you what God says. And then it's not my job, it's, I just let the chips fall where they may. And wherever your life is not in alignment, that's your responsibility to say, God, I won't suppress this truth. I embrace truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I bless you before you go? Next week, I want you to come in here and bring your kids, not your infants. We're going to have our nursery open. But we're going to ask everybody to bring your kids in here. I know you like, oh, God, I'm not coming next week. There's going to be kids running everywhere. I'm going to lay hands on every kid in this building to build a hedge around them when they go into this school year. And what touches everybody else ain't gonna touch your children, hallelujah. The end of the service, I'm gonna lay hands on every one of them. So please be here next week with your children, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he establish you and give you peace in Jesus' name. I love you. Go have the best week you've ever had. See you next week.